Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so a actually, it'll be much more detailed because most because because somehow this turned off, this talk turned into an overall review of of a lot of results in computational complexity and and uh, of course I could uh, I'll get to the there'll be a very small section for what I'll be talk talking about more tomorrow but but if you of course if you have questions I can ex I can expand um, so just just in general if you begin with geometric topology, you could then ask what, what role does computational complexity play? And uh, it's, it's an opportunity to start thinking about complexity because the natural thing uh, that geometric topologists like to do uh, is, is classify. And so if you think about what the word classification is going to mean, uh, for, for a while, uh, uh, the, the groups such as the topologists didn't really think very hard about what classification should mean. But it actually, it should mean at a bare minimum uh, uh, that, uh, that the question, uh, the, the, that the question of, of d distinguishing, say, topological objects from each other, manifolds or something else, is, is at a bare minimum recursive. Otherwise, how can you call it a classification? <laughs> okay. Uh, so so in, it, it just just... You, you end up in, in complexity theory concerns just in, th in thinking about what the word classification really means. Okay. So here is a mini summary. So uh, of course geometric topologists look at more than just manifolds, but manifolds are a favorite. So l l let's just take the, the, the favorite setting in, in all dimensions. Uh, there are three flavors of manifolds. Uh, smooth manifolds, well there are more than three, but there are three main ones. Smooth manifolds, piecewise linear manifolds, and topological manifolds. So here's a summary of where the field of topology is with, with that class of objects. Um, classifying zero and one dimensional manifolds. Well, I hope it, you guys know the solution. <laughs> <laughs> At least in the case of compact. I, don't th I guess I didn't say compact on this slide, but let's just take compact manifolds. There you go. Okay. Which is not, which is difficult. But I'm going to make it easier. C connected compact manifolds. <laughs> 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 um, so in two dimensions, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it trivial, but the answer is easy. But there's one not really quite trivial theorem, which is uh, the the uh, actually it's trivial. It, it's, it was non-trivial even to discover this. The distinction between uh, smooth and piecewise linear and topological manifolds. Um, they are all three the same up to, all, all three equivalent for the classification question up to dimension three. Then in dimension four, smooth and piecewise linear um, are, are still the same. Uh, actually, they're still, still the same up to dimension six. But starting in dimension four, piecewise linear is different from topological. And from dimension seven onwards, sm smooth is di different from piecewise linear. Okay. So uh, now, if you take the uh, question just head on, what what are the compact compact uh, manifolds or closed manifolds? It's not really going to be different for this for the purposes of the, of this chart. Um, well, okay. To be safe, let's say uh, manifolds with close, uh, compact manifolds with no boundary. Then, um, in dimensions four and higher, a classification is impossible. Okay, and to get to that result, well, the answer is that um, it's not recursive. Um, the question of telling whether two closed manifolds in dimension four and higher is recursively enumerable, but not recursive, and th that allows you to put the word impossible there, rather than just open. Okay. Uh, on the other hand. The whole, this word impossible springs entirely from the fundamental group. Um, <laughs> if the fundamental group is trivial, then in dimensions five and higher, uh, in the sense of uh, computer science, yes, there's a classification. Uh, and the same thing is true in dimension four in the topological category. Then there was the dramatic recent progress, the proof of the geometrization theorem that uh, gives you that, the, that uh, whether or not the fundamental group is trivial, you get a classification in dimension three. And then that leaves one remaining case in this simplified chart. 
Okay, now if you think about it, rather than just trivial or non-trivial -tri or, or unrestricted fundamental group, you could talk about controlled fundamental group. And so, so actually the chart should be more complicated that way. But with trivial fundamental group, there's one remaining case, which is the smooth, smooth or which is equivalent to PL for four manifolds, and that is just a genuine, genuinely open problem in op open case in geometric topology. That's that's all that's left in in this in this summary. Okay, so good. Um, so, uh, but what now does this mean for complexity theory? Well, the fir first question is uh, uh, how do you even describe a manifold to a computer? Okay. <laughs> so uh, that's harder than you might think. Okay. <laughs> the first thing you think of is, oh, a simplicial complex, or in combinatorics terms, you can say a hypergraph. That's basically the same thing. Okay. It's not quite exactly the same thing, but close enough. Okay. So we would like the manifold to be a simplicial complex. It's, it's triangulated. So here's the first piece of bad news. Even to know if it is a manifold, if you're given a simplicial complex, that's already uncomputable. And I'm going to be more precise about how it's uncomputable. It's, it's, it's RE, but not R. So it's, and, and it's, in fact, halt and complete. Okay. <laughs> Why? Well, because the uh, examining the link of a vertex to see if it's a sphere is the same Class, classification problem in the previous dimension. Okay. So uh, that may make it look like the story's over. You can't even tell if it's a manifold or not, but it's not quite like that. You could take restricted types of simplicial complexes. And then, then you have input where you can actually check whether the input is valid, never mind what the question after that is, and then keep moving. Okay. <laughs> So here's the simplest idea for, for safe input. We just ask that the star of every vertex in, uh, in um, the uh, simplicial complex is um, equivalent to, is the cone over a convex simplicial polytope. Why would you stop in the middle? Just all of the neighbors. So all the hyperedges contain. Right, or the union, yeah. I'll draw a picture of a star. So, like, if you have a surface with triangles, you just take all of the triangles, all of the hyperedges that contain V, and all of their faces. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> Well, the, well, two dimensional. The pentagon is not. No, it's a simplicial complex. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's a good idea, but um, well, I said it turns out that I, I, I think I didn't really check carefully, but it, but I think what happens is that you it, it works, but it's a little bit of a surprise. It actually gives you a model for smooth manifolds rather than PL manifolds. That's what I think happens. Okay, so it's a, so so it's so so th this part is already tricky, but let's keep moving. Okay, so theorem, you have you have these f three flavors of manifolds, but I wasn't precise about what order they come in, and um, so uh, if you want to study them, this is not a, really a, mainly a complexity result, but if you want to study the matter, then then there, then part of it is the reverse of what you expected. A smooth manifold has a unique piecewise linear structure that comes with it, and that's a result of Whitehead. You might have thought it was the other way around, but no, it goes in that order. And of course, trivially, um, a piecewise linear manifold or a smooth manifold has a unique topological structure. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the, if you think of just uh, the set of distinct, the set of equivalence classes of manifolds, there's a map from smooth to PL and another map from PL to topological. And eventually, uh, n both maps are neither one-to-one -one nor onto. So you can have a PL manifold with no smooth structure or a PL manifold with more than one smooth structure. Um, but now there's this fantastic pair of theorems that uh, kills, that 
sort of ends these distinctions from the point of view of complexity, that in any fixed dimension, well, okay, it doesn't end the story uniformly in dimension, but non-uniformly in any fixed dimension it ends the story, okay. Um, Curver and Milner between them, and uh, actually some, I should list more people, but these two are the main ones, showed that there's only a finite amount of difference between P smooth and PL compact manifolds. So, so the, that's a, it's only a finite, so f in, in each fixed dimension, that's only a finite amount of one. Um, that's one thing that I mean, but also the, uh, there's, there's a, f there's, um, uh, there's a c computation in a finite ring to see, to see if, uh, if a PL manifold has a smooth structure. That computation is, is essentially linear algebra and is polynomial time. Okay. <laughs> okay. In each fixed dimension. But, but, um, <laughs> Right, so the, there ends up being a lot of computations that are that are essentially linear algebra, but not but over a ring rather than a field, and and you, and I'll mention something about this later. What I think happens, although I didn't check carefully, is that non you get non uniformly polynomial time, and then there's the more difficult and striking theorem that the same thing happens uh, for this transition from PL to topological manifolds, except in dimension four. Uh, what? Well, I can give a physics-y answer uh, <laughs> because it's the critical dimension. <laughs> um, uh, the mathematician's answer is because that's what they proved. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> there is a certain method. Okay, I can give you a little bit better a answer. It, it was discovered s since the work of Smale that fi dimensions five and higher behave differently. Uh, why? Because just in general in geometric topology, dimensions one and two and co-dimensions one and two play a special role in constructions. Okay, like the fundamental group is entirely governed by what happens in dimensions one and two in, in the one-dimensional and two-dimensional things. Now, in five dimensions and higher, two two-dimensional things in general position just miss each other. And so in that s specific sense, that's called the Whitney, something called the Whitney trick. You have enough room from dimensions five and onward, and the answers just change. Now, and before you get to dimension five, things get more and more difficult and complicated until f suddenly they get easier. <laughs> And, and in dimension four, you have the most complicated answers for a lot of things. Well, the, this is no. It has nothing to do with the fundamental group. It's in a, it's a it's an abelian. It's an invariant over Z mod two, and I'm cheating a little bit because. Actually, strictly speaking, without this theorem, you wouldn't have a, way, a finite way to describe a, to a topological manifold <laughs> that doesn't have a triangulation. But one of the things that this theorem gives you is, is a finite description of topological manifolds in the first place. And now, simply connected four manifolds also have a finite description, and I'm not completely sure what has been established if you have instead controlled Phi one and topological manifolds in four dimensions. So that's another. I, so I, I glossed over what's missing in dimension four a little bit. For controlled Phi one, for topological four manifolds, I, I'm not, I, there, every, I think anyone would conjecture that there is a finite description still, but, uh, but I'm not really sure what's, what's, what's been proven. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this last sentence is a little bit incomplete that way. Okay, so um, now uh, everything in sight is going to at least be recursively enumerable. Um, and the engine of that is this, in the PL case, say, <coughs> is this theorem establishing moves between triangulations that are 
that connect every two triangulations for the, sa the same uh, PL manifold, piecewise linear manifold. So I will draw a picture of the Pachner moves for you. They're, 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 not the, the, they're not the most general because they only apply to manifolds, but they're really neat. They're easier to draw than, than, than the bistellar moves that I, the stellar moves that I think are due to Newman. Um, so for surfaces, the Pachner moves look like this. You can have a diagonal flip, or you can replace one triangle by three. Now, if you think about what these moves are doing, then actually there's a uh, natural generalization to higher dimensions. You think of the, you have the manifold, you think of it as a triangulated surface, and you attach a simplex uh, in the next dimension, and you think of that as a blister on the manifold, and then you go around the other side of the simplex. You can, you can sort of see that that's what you're doing here. Uh, you're using a tetrahedron to make the moves in two dimensions, and that's what you do in general. Um, so you get recursive enumerability for the classification problem just, for, just once you show that these moves connect, connect everything to everything for the same manifold. Okay, assisted by the results on the previous slide for the smooth and topological cases. Okay. <laughs> and so that's very similar to the Reitemeister moves for knots, which you can, if you want to, you could prove the Reitemeister theorem from this one. It's not the easiest way to prove the Reitemeister theorem, but it's, it's a way you, that, that knot diagrams are connected by the Reitemeister moves. So w once you prove that these moves are sufficient, then you know that, that not isomorphism questions are at least recursively enumerable. No, the Hauptvermutung is, is the theorem that topological and PL classification of surfaces is the same. No, that's an, that's important, but that's orthogonal. The, the that that theory, I mean, this P Newman Pachner thing is is a cleaned up version of that. I mean, otherwise, who knows what would be meant by a subdivision? But the, this 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 at least well, you could guess that it's something recursively enumerable, but but this puts it in a very crisp form that so that you can reach subdivisions by these moves. Okay. You, you, then you would prove separately that there is any such thing like subdivision. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the bad news, which I already mentioned, but uh, I will give credit for it and explain how it happens. Uh, so first of all, there's this beautiful, well, beautiful pair of results by father and son, <laughs> Novikov Sr. and Novikov Jr. <laughs> so uh, Novikov Sr., uh, showed that recognizing the trivial group, if you have a finitely presented group, is halting complete. It's clearly recursively enumerable, and then he showed that it's halting hard. Okay. Well, actually, it's not clearly recursively enumerable, but there's a set of moves for that too, and so it's recursively enumerable. Um, and then there was a refinement of this result. So, so this, this sort of shows you what's coming. You, if, you, if you have a manifold starting in dimension four, the fundamental group, a compact manifold, the fundamental group uh, can be anything finitely presented. Um, in dimension four and higher. Because uh, you, what you immediately get from the finite presentation is uh, a two-dimensional hypergraph, two-dimensional simplicial complex. Okay. Now imagine, for instance, putting this two-dimensional complex in five dimensions and just in general position so that it mis misses itself, and then just take a neighborhood, take a tube or a neighborhood of it. And then, then you get a five-manifold with boundary. So I didn't, that's not a closed five-manifold, but you, the, the boundary is not a problem. There's a variation of that construction so that you get something closed. So that's in five dimensions, but there's a way to make this kind of thing work in four dimensions as well. Uh, 
I like his question better. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay. Um. Anyway, uh, Novikov Jr. refined his father's result to make a Five manifold or hi anything higher dimensional that has that's a homology sphere. So it means that if you knew that the fundamental group was trivial, then it would be a sphere by the higher dimensional Poincare conjecture. Okay. On the other hand, uh, the fundamental group can still be anything. Okay. Well, anything, uh, any perfect group, because if it's not perfect, then it would have some first homology. Okay. And so then this halting completeness is just refined to get you, 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 you cannot recognize the end sphere. Okay. So there's not enough room in dimension four for what Novikov Jr. did if you wanted the four sphere. But you can make another four manifold. I'm not sure exactly which one it is, but there are other, there, you can certainly make pairs of four manifolds where it's halting complete to tell if they're the same because you just because you don't understand the fundamental groups. You, or you don't even know if the fundamental group is trivial. Um. But what you said before, if you have the dimension of dimensional simple connectedness, it's okay. R right. In fact, in four dimensions, if it's simply connected and closed, if it's simply connected with boundary, that's a little bit different. But if it's simply connected and closed, then in the topological category, it's as simple as just computing its homology groups and uh, the homology cohomology ring, the intersection product. But the fact that it's also no, but no, it's it gets more and more complex. I'll just summarize. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's halting hard to calculate fundamental groups. But the cohomology group is easy. Cohomology group is easy. It's not quite enough. You, you will want at least the cohomology ring, but that's not really difficult either. What? Cup products or cap products. The, the products in the, in the, in the ring. <laughs> okay. Uh, right, so theorem of Edgar Brown, that if you have a tame topological space, and if you won't, and I did, I'm not precise about what that means, but we can take a simplicial complex. If you take two of them, then you can, then there, it is recursive to compute the homotopy classes of maps between them, okay? And I wrote that I believe uh, or conjecture that Brown's theorem implies uh, that if you have simply connected closed manifolds, then you get not that it's non-uniformly in P to, to tell if they're isomorphic. But now that I'm reading this, I realize that it's false. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I, I put conjecture, but it's false. Um, the problem is, since apropos of the question, that a cohomology ring can ha have embedded inside it a tensor. And uh, isomorphism of tensors is uh, at least as difficult as graph isomorphism. No, 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 no. Uh, consider the problem, first of all, over a field as a, simpl as a simpler case of, of um, when, mat when matrices are conjugate. If they're two-dimensional matrices, then, of course, there's the undergraduate material that, that's in polynomial time. But if they're three-dimensional matrices, if they're A by B by C matrices, or, yeah, even that case, or A by A by A matrices, uh, 
and you have simultaneous conjugation in each direction, then it's at least as difficult as graph isomorphism to, to tell whether the matrices are equivalent. <coughs> Um, right, but anyway, it's at least as hard as that. It's at least as hard as understanding tensors over the integers, probably. And I, and I'm not sure if it's NP complete, but it's there's no they're not fast algorithms actually. Okay. <laughs> um. Well, this is, a, this is a good question, and by that I mean I don't have a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it means at least the following, that if one of the space, if the domain is a sphere, then you get a homotopy group. And Brown proved that these, uh, so then in the simply connected case, or whether well, not it's simply connected, but these homotopy groups, no, sorry, in the simply connected case, these homotopy groups are all finitely generated abelian groups. And so Brown's algorithm will tell you exactly what they are. Now, if you have two general spaces, then they will not be abelian groups. The set, the set of homotopy classes will not be an abelian group. It'll be a set. However, I guess what happens is that it'll be a set assembled from abelian groups in one way or another using the Posnikov tower business. And Brown's algorithm will tell you exactly what you, what you have. I guess the question is also, I mean, as an interpreter, also, if you compute the homotopy classes, it does not mean that you can actually produce a representative of each homotopy class. Right? No, I think his algorithm actually does that. I think it, I think it produces a representative. Uh, well, but there you see there can be infinitely many. So I have to be careful about what this looks like. It's not a group, but it's assembled from finitely generated abelian groups. And, and so you can sort of pretend that it's, a, that it's an abelian group. But for the homotopy groups of spheres, you can actually produce all the homotopy classes. Um, I, th I, th I think he can produce an example. OK. It's very slow, right? Well, you see, except for this tensor problem, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's it's far worse. The tensor problem is no worse than NP. Okay, <laughs> uh, that's that's fam famously thought to be hard, but it's only so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's no worse than exponential time if it's in NP. And uh, but that's the answer. These are the considerations non-uniformly in dimension. Uh, this stuff uniformly in dimension uh, can be really really hard. And all that's really known is this theorem that I threw in by Anik that it's at least sharply hard. And I don't know if it, it could be worse than exponential time for, for all I know. Well, well, okay. So, uh, uh, so polynomial time P means that the computer works by itself and produces an answer of yes or no. Then in NP, what? Yeah, let's say that one way or another for all of these classes, there is, there is uh, a, a computer which, you can, which is called uh, uh, the, the audience, the verifier, the, uh, also called Arthur in different examples who does a polynomial amount of work, OK? Then for P, uh, uh, the verifier is just by himself and has to compute the answer, yes or no. For NP, the, if the answer is the yes, then the verifier is shown a certificate um, uh, and the, that convinces him that the answer is yes. But if the answer is no, then no service certificate convinces him. Now, sharp P is a different class. Uh, uh, that um, sharp P is a different class where 
instead of being yes, no valued, it's, it's integer valued. It's the number of certificates of some fixed length that satisfy the criterion. So to give, to give a reference in another field of mathematics, uh, whether or not a, an algebraic variety has a rational point, uh, sorry, a, 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 an FQ rational point over a, finite, over a fixed finite field is NP hard because the certificate is that you can produce the point. How many FQ rational points it has is Sharpie hard, is Sharpie complete, okay? <laughs> and uh, in a qualitative sense, uh, Sharpie is much, is much beefier than NP. <laughs> uh, there's a theorem called Toda's theorem which demonstrates that it, that it, that it, it looks like it's a lot more, okay? <laughs> No, 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 no. Uh, Annex theorem should be thought of as n is not a constant, n is part of the input. The n is written in uni unary, or you can just skip it. The input is a hypergraph with some obvious reason that you get something simply connected. And then there's another parameter, I guess, k, which is the, the, the uh, dimension of the homotopy group that you want. And you're just supposed to say which finitely generated abelian group it is, like the third homotopy group of this four-dimensional uh, complex, and Annick showed that, uh, that this is uh, Sharpie hard. Okay. Yeah, is, are we asking for a different algorithm for each n, or what we consider the different algorithm for each n, or is it supposed to be one algorithm with n as input? Okay. I mean, it could be the, actually the same algorithm, but you have different asymptotics if you fix n or not. Okay, so uh, now in three dimensions, something much more exciting happens because all of this bad news, <coughs> so there's this, uh, it's a little bit disappointing in a way in, in dimensions five and higher what happens. Everything is totally impossible unless you control pi 1, but then if you do, then it no longer looks like topology, it looks like linear, multilinear algebra questions, okay? Um, in three dimensions, that does not happen. There is, first of all, now the, I can just call it a theorem, the, the geometrization conjecture, the geometrization theorem, that there is, uh, in, a, in a reasonable sense, which I, I'll describe here, uh, an explicit list of all of the compact three manifolds. Um, and one of the, uh, um, facts that you get, in fact, this was sort of appreciated long before this was proven, is that the fundamental group of a three manifold is, is very restricted. Uh, it's much more complicated than what it can be in two dimensions, but still very, very special compared to higher dimensions. Okay. Well, Based on the you, you have to hedge a little, uh, you have, so in order to state this correctly, you have to hedge it because a general three manifold is not necessarily geometric by itself, but it rather is made from geometric pieces. Um, but the, the most interesting type of piece is a hyperbolic piece or a hyperbolic three manifold. And then it's as simple as that if you have a geometric triangulation, that the simplices are hyperbolic, uh, straight simplest hyperbolic geometric tetrahedra. So they have hyperbolic, they have lengths and angles satisfying the hyperbolic laws. And the extra decoration that you want is just the geometric shape of the, of the tetrahedron. Okay. <laughs> so if you have a geometric triangulate, now even a hyperbolic manifold has non-geometric triangulations because there's this, this beautiful long known example in the spherical case where you have, a, you can have a knotted, you can have one knotted tetrahedron or, or three tetrahedron that chain together to make a very complicated knot inside. inside. Are there still moves that go from uh, non-geometric triangulations to a geometric one? Those ones. <laughs> right. So first of all, there is, there is a special class of geometric triangulations, not a, not a, 
a one-to-one -one list exactly, but just nice uh, triangulations with the extra geometric data, so that if you have that, uh, it is in some sense easy to tell whether the two manifolds are the same. Now, there's a little bit of a cheat here. The extra data may be very, very verbose in principle uh, compared to the number of simplices, so that it's easy to tell as a function of the input length, but, uh, uh, but the input ha could suddenly have become huge because this angle information might be a lot of work. It doesn't look like it's possible because it's a linear number of angles and lengths uh, compared to the number of tetrahedra. But the, the angles and lengths could, in principle, be very, very complicated numbers. <laughs> They're algebraic, but... as a <laughs> Well, yeah, that's what I was saying at the beginning. You can, you, that's something to think about, but the consensus answer is this way. Okay. Um. <laughs> No, it's very difficult. But if, if it is, it's nonlinear. It's a nonlinear algebraic problem. You could say that it's recursive by it, test. Yeah, you could say that it's recursive by the by uh, what's called Tarski's elimination theory. That just so gen. Yeah, bounds, but bounds that change what it means to be do working in polynomial time, you see. Oh, I agree, but I'm just curious about the so no obvious bound of the line. Ah, you don't know how much you have to subdivide the triangulation so to. <laughs> <laughs> but the geometrization theorem says that if you just keep working, you can subdivide it enough. You have these two manifolds, and you want to know if they're the same. You could just keep working and subdivide both of them enough until you have geometric triangulations on both sides. then go through the real algebraic geometry to get the lengths and angles, and then, uh, and then, then, it's, then it'll be easy to tell if they're the same. Okay. So uh, why is there no bound? I mean, what's the nature of why there's no bound on how much you need to triangulate? Like well, that's a good question in the sense that it's an open problem. No one knows. <laughs> Well, look, I mean, this is a general s status statement that's not specific to Perelman's technique. But now, if you look at Perelman's technique, you could hope for a way out and get some bounds. Um, and at the very least, um, unfortunately, Perelman's <coughs> technique is, at best, numerical analysis, where it's difficult to get, it, it's at least messy to get rigorous, <laughs> rigorous calculation bounds, because you don't know exactly how much numerical precision you need. Uh, <laughs> In Perelman's proof, it it where the issue is depends on whose method you're using. Okay, <laughs> okay. If you're using Perelman's method to prove all of geometrization, then um, one problem is the extinction time business. But another problem is is that you don't know exactly how much numerical analysis you need in, in to simulate the Ricci flow, even when you don't have the when you don't have bubbling off or ex surgery or extinction. Okay. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, so it all, over, all over, I was discussing this a little bit with John Morgan, and, and through Perelman's proof, you have appeals to compactness arguments and things like that, where you, you'd have, where it would be at best messy to go through, and you probably wouldn't get very good bounds. But maybe, maybe if you were simply disciplined and went through the. I would. Yeah, so Terry uh, Tao has this sort of question of making everything finitary, and uh, there are a lot of things that can be made finitary if you just are disciplined and work carefully. And I don't know whether, whether you can expect uh, uh, a bound so from. There's no obvious bound, but there's also no obvious barrier to making it. Yeah, it, <laughs> right, right, right. The, the situation, since, since Perelman uses PDE methods, the situation is very messy. Yeah, he also uses compactness arguments. So you're saying his proof is not effective? What? You're saying his proof is not effective? No. It's not. It's not. 
It, no, his proof is not known to be, the right statement is it's, it's unclear whether Perelman's proof is effective or not. It's not, it's not clear how much. Yeah. It's not written in an effective way, but maybe if, it, maybe if you just rewrote it again a little bit differently, then it, then it would be, possibly it would clearly would be effective. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, yeah? Well, this theorem itself uh, tells you what f sort of fundamental groups that you get. The main class, in, s in a sense, is from the hyperbolic pieces. You get a, you get a discrete, in, in, in context, a discrete co-compact uh, uh, subgroup uh, of um, uh, isometries of H3, which is then the same as a discrete co-compact subgroup, or, say co or maybe cofinite subgroup, of SL2C. Yeah, it does. Uh, but l I guess I'll say it this way. Uh, uh, three manifold groups look a lot like discrete subgroups of SL2C. Okay, they don't have to be exactly that, but either that or something very or something fairly similar. You can also get things like free products of those if you make it connected some. But think think of s discrete subgroups of SL2C. That's the main class. <coughs> fundamental group. Well, then you then you get into the controlled fundamental group version of these higher dimensional questions. And even if it's finite, even if it's a finite group, there was a lot of work that was left undone, uh, especially in dimension four. No. No, those are also restricted. Those will be uh, all, all the, they'll, they'll be the finite subgroups of SO4 if you include orbifold, but the, the subgroups that don't have fixed points when acting on the tree sphere. Every, the, you get the finite, the finite groups that you can get here are exactly like this. You, you have a finite group acting on round S3 with no fixed points. Just the, the groups that can do that, okay. Um. Okay. Uh, now, it's not very sad. This is, in a sense, the status quo in dimension um, three, but for general manifolds. But actually, sort of more, n more is known than that. So I will say uh, now, uh, pass to a s special case of three manifolds that, that are a little bit easier, namely, not in, namely looking at knots or knots and links. So they're equivalent to not complements, and those are three manifolds with boundary. So that's a good case to look at. Okay, it's it's kind of easier than general three manifolds, but not really so much easier. And it, so if you do, if you do something for knots, then you you've made real progress for for other three manifolds. So, older theorem of Hawken from the 1960s. In fact, he proved it in the 50s, but didn't publish for a while. Uh, that it's recursive to distinguish the unknot from other knots. I didn't say it was obvious. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but you you know that know. It, you, you, <laughs> it's not the difficult issue here. It, Okay. <laughs> Actually, it's not true. Tame knots are equivalent to knot complements, <laughs> but we're working with tame. Well, let's work with tame knots. Okay, knots that you that admit a tubular neighborhood. Th those are equivalent to knot complements, um, and those are three manifolds of boundary. So, <laughs> long before geometrization was even stated, Hawken showed that it's recursive to distinguish the unknot, and let me talk about how he did that. Um, he, he looks for a disk whose boundary is the, is the knot. And if there is one, then, uh, then it's a, uh, a knot. Okay. And how does he look for that? Well, he developed this, this uh, important 
At first it just looked clever, but now it just it really looks quite important. It's called normal surface theory. And what normal surface theory looks like is this. You have your triangulated three manifold, maybe not complement, maybe something else. And then inside you consider surfaces, after all we're looking for a disk, which is some sort of surface then, where <coughs> which are only uh, allowed to intersect each uh, tetrahedron linearly. The surface is actually piecewise linear. It can bend when you go to the next tetrahedron. But that's the only structure you've got anyway. But then um, here when you are, you can get two types of things. You, you can get triangles like that. And you can also get quadrilaterals. So you can get triangles and quadrilaterals. And uh, the triangles stack up. So the, you can think of uh, uh, the, so, so a surface in this special position is called normal. And the first thing that you prove is that the surfaces that you care about uh, all can be made normal, okay? <laughs> uh, but that so that's that's one piece of topology work that Hawken did, and that's true. Right. Okay. <laughs> the yes, with no subdivision. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then. Uh, yes. Yes. Yes, uh, and it, it may be better not to have it, maybe, maybe to have the knot do the same thing in the triangles rather than to have it travel along the edges. But that's not a, a fundamental you issue. So you take a triangle of the triangulation of the, of the complement? Yeah, you take a triangulation of the complement and then, and then the, um, <laughs> the, knot, the knot itself, let's see. L l l let me think of a safe way to do this. Uh, actually, I take it back. Uh, the knot is drilled out of the sphere, and then you triangulate the complement. So uh, the knot is actually absent. The, the surface just stops at the wall of the space. Okay. That's the, that's the safest. That's not the only way to do it, but that's the safest a answer. Okay. And then you're looking for the disk and the discovery. That's right. So, so the ambient space has a wall which is a torus and then you're looking at something that stops in a circle at, at the wall. Okay. So the triangles actually you can move them to the to the corners and they all miss each other. The the quadrilateral and they miss the quadrilaterals too, but the, the quadrilaterals intersect each other actually. Any two of the there are three types of quadrilaterals and they all intersect. So in each tetrahedron you, if you have an embedded surface, you can only have one type of quadrilateral. Well, that's, that's choosing one out of three, and that's a, that, that you could handle with a combinatorial search if you're looking for something. Okay? And then the number of disks, uh, the number of triangles or quadrilaterals is some integer. So you can store those integers for each tetrahedron. And you have, you have five integers stored for each tetrahedron. And then what Hawken showed th is that the remaining work uh, can be handled by integer programming. <laughs> okay. Uh, namely, um, so, so in particular he found an algorithm um, beca because, because there's an inter integer programming stage to find these normal surfaces and you can ins inspect them individually to see what they are. And one of them will be this disk. Well, uh, he he wasn't worried about that. He was he was doing he was he he just wanted the upper bound that he wanted was that the problem was in R. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but of course you could. <laughs> okay, and that comes on the next slide. <laughs> okay. Now you might have thought of trying to to attack Reitermeister moves, and lately there's been some progress with that, but much later, and only using Hawkins' theory as a starting point. Well, uh, 
they're not where the ideas are. <laughs> I, I mean, Hawken, Hawken is an engine, Hawken's, Hawken's ideas are an engine for progress. And eventually, after a lot more work, you, uh, you get back to write a Meister moves and prove something about them. Right. The basic problem is that, the, yeah, yeah, it gives you RE but not R, and the, then you need more ideas, and the ideas didn't come from that model. They came from this model. Yeah. Appel yeah, that's right. So, uh, precisely as Igor was asking, if you look carefully at Hawkins' algorithm, it, it, it shows you that unknottedness is in NP the disk becomes an NP certificate. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's more, it's not just, it's not as simple as, as, it's not really as simple as just reading Hawkins' paper. Hawkins didn't really know this theorem. It doesn't require much more, but it requires something more. Okay. <sighs> what else does it require? Well, first of all, you have to check the integer programming and get some bound on these integers. But just be, j Purely because it is integer programming, you get some bounds for using the um, Hadamard inequality for determinants of matrices and so on. So what bounds do you get? These numbers aren't polynomial in the size of the inputs, but the number of digits always is in integer programming in general. <laughs> okay, that's good enough. In fact, the, the disk may truly have exponential area, but it's not, but the cert certificate isn't the same size as the disk. Because of this compression, the disk can be much larger than its description. Okay. That's also, I guess, part of why why uh, Hawkins idea is good because you can draw them up to this degree one at a time, whereas here, you can just end the code. Yeah, because the disk is very stacks up as a lot of lot of, a whole lot of sheets in parallel. You get you you get a shortcut here. Okay. <laughs> No, it's not. It's it's yeah. Yeah, right. Right, but right, right. But so because n may be exp is allowed to be exponential, only the number of digits in n, this n is polynomial. Then uh, you have to be careful. You can compute this Euler the Euler characteristic of this thing easily with algebra. Okay, but. It's not obvious if it's easy to tell whether it's connected. <laughs> you wanted it to be a disk, and of course it's recursive whether it's connected, but can you compute it quickly? Okay. Well, there is an algorithm. Uh, there's more than one, one way to show that. In the first proof, they, they used a the theorem that there exists a disk which is a vertex solution to the integer programming problem. And then and a vertex solution has to be connected, actually, because if, if it's a union of two pieces, two surfaces, then it's not a vertex okay, <laughs> of the, of the uh, uh, linear integer programming problem. Vertex so, the right, vertex in the sense of integer and linear programming. Okay. So their first, their first proof switched to linear programming over the rationals as, as a way to solve that stage of the problem. That doesn't make it polynomial time because the choices of where the quadrilaterals are is still a combinatorial search and requires a certificate. Okay. Now in the second proof, they produced an algorithm to uh, uh, what they call a dynamical algorithm, but in any case an algorithm to see whether or not one of these normal surfaces is connected, even if you know, no, even whether or not it's, a, no matter, even if you don't know other stuff about it. The same result in two different ways with, with different generalizations. Okay. The first result used the vertex solution technique. The second result used a special algorithm here to see, if the, to see if it's a connected surface. If it's not, it could be something that's simply masquerading as a disk. A surface with, with Euler characteristic one, that looks good, but because it's not connected, it isn't a disk. <laughs> it could be a punctured torus and a sphere. <laughs> And uh, it's not so obvious whether it's connected or not. Uh, but y there is an algorithm to see. <laughs> okay. So these same ideas, it, with more work, 
uh, apply to, I, I said, you know, you can use knots as a warm up and see what then you can do for other manifolds. And in fact, you can, it's essentially a strengthening of the result, recognizing the three spheres recursive. That's Rubenstein Thompson. That was following Hawkins' work. And they needed a generalization called almost normal surface theory, uh, just a little bit different from the normal surfaces where you're also allowed a, an octagon in one place. Those are called almost normal surfaces. And, um, and then uh, Saul Schleimer did the, the, the analog of, uh, I'm not sure which method he used, but one of these two papers to show that that's in NP as well. Okay. <coughs> um. Now we might be serious. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't, it's, it's the best I could do. I, it's the, it's <laughs> That's the result that I have. <laughs> okay. So, previous slide. So, pay attention. So, unknottedness is in NP. If it isn't, if it isn't, if it's the unknot, then uh, uh, the prover, the Merlin, can provide you uh, a proof that you can, convincing proof that you can check quickly. But that prover won't tell you anything if it is knotted. There's no, no proof is provided for that with these methods. And that remained an open problem afterwards. Okay. Yeah? Oh, you mean unconditionally? Uh, I mean, with GRH, it's in... Uh, it's, it's, um, I mean, it's the integer... Oh, sorry, yeah, there's, right. Well, basically, it reduced it to the level of integer programming, so whatever, okay, okay. So, so knottedness is in NP, and so for Peter's benefit, I will give a mini chart of a little bit more of complexity. What? What it really uses is another conjecture that's not even statistical, just an existence problem uh, that, that looks, to me, a whole lot weaker than GRH. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I, uh, right. The conjecture is that if you have a monic, um, right, so conjecture, uh, given A of X an integer polynomial, monic, okay, it has, uh, sorry, so there exists an early prime P uh, mod which A of X has a root. Well, a lot simpler than A of X. So let's say, uh, so what I need is that uh, log P, let's see, let's see what I need, that uh, lo log P is no worse than polynomial in <coughs> log log the norm of A. Okay, which is actually weaker. Th this is weaker, weaker than. Well, G, I mean, GRH. <laughs> well, what you want is what's called um, effective Chebotarov density. 
Right. <laughs> okay. Well, th this is a conjecture which follows from GRH, and which you can take, which you you can you're free to believe that it's much easier than GRH. I don't know. It's any, anyway, it's another conjecture. <laughs> right. But what I'd like to say. What I'd like to say is that GRH actually gives you a, a, a statistical supply of these, and I, I only need one. <laughs> it gives you a statistical, it, GRH gives you a good statistical supply early. It gives you zillions of them, and I only need one. <laughs> Uh, um, oh, a a can a is certainly re just for just for um. Yeah, sure, sure. Tomorrow, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So there is this theorem in complexity of Quran that for the question of finding solutions to algebraic equations, you can approximate the complex numbers by z mod p, or actually I shouldn't say c here, it's actually q bar that's being approximated by z mod p. Uh, but you can approximate c by q bar, so, so um, you can approximate c by q bar, and then q bar by z mod p for that prime, uh, in order to tell whether uh, algebraic equations uh, have a complex solution. Uh, you can, you, for his theorem, in fact, one prime is not enough. He does need a statistical supply of primes to be, to have a convincing argument that there is a complex solution. But actually, for what I'm doing, one prime is enough. Um, you replace C by a finite field, prime field even, and then uh, what you get uh, is a finite group quotient of the fundamental group or a non-abelian represent representation of the fundamental group of the not complement uh, over a finite field and that and since it's non-abelian that shows that it's not the unknot. Okay. Um, now I said in answer to a question that if you have a hyperbolic three manifold like a hyperbolic knot then the fundamental group is in fact a subgroup of SL2C. And that sort of tells you where the idea comes from already. But that, the, that idea is not enough in this style of doing things for knots that are called satellite knots. So the, the knot is, is, is a, a woven cable of some kind in, in a jacket, in a torus jacket, and that torus is itself knotted. That's called a satellite knot. And those are made of several pieces. Maybe some of them are hyperbolic and some of them are not. And uh, those are not, pi 1 is no longer a subgroup of SL2C and you get a technical difficulty. Uh, but uh, out from another source, not geometrization, using gauge theory, there is a theorem of Kronheimer and Mocha that pi 1 of every knot complement uh, other than the unknot has a non-trivial representation in SU2. So that's good enough to plug into this machinery. Okay. There is an no, non-abelian. No, 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 no. It not, nobody, uh, injectivity is not controlled. Non-commutative representation. Okay. Uh, so that's enough for this m machinery. So the certificate then is, is, if you like, a finite group quotient that shows you that, the fun, that this is non-abelian. And so then, then it, uh, well, in the whole thing that I'm doing, I'm, uh, the, the, the verifier comes out from somewhere and, Del delivers you the proof, and you just have to check it. Prover. The prover, yeah, sorry, the prover, yes. Oh, Kronheimer and Rovka. Uh, it was, I mean, it's their paper that did the final piece, but you need the th this huge machinery of gauge theory, and it's not particularly easier than than geometrization. <laughs> No. It's not necessarily two by two matrices, 
No, I actually, you're, I, I, I learned it the hard way. <laughs> I, I thought that you, you get from geometrization that if you have a hyperbolic, that if you have a manifold with hyperbolic pieces, that you get that pi 1 is linear. Uh, but that is now known thanks to the um, uh, Agol and, um, what? No, no, a Agol and Wise. Okay, the fundamental group is linear, but by that method, the matrices could be enormous. I thought I had a cheap proof that not groups are linear, but but I, I, I my joke was that I had to pepper spray that draft. <laughs> that was around the same time, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, 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 no. The point is that the if suppose you have a manifold made from two hyperbolic pieces connected by a torus, then the, those tori have, can have different shape and uh, the, 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 the linear representations that you get from geometrization do not fit together. You have to make a deformation to get them to fit together and that deformation theory is the hard part. Even in larger matrices, they do not fit together. I thought that, that if you just go to four by four matrices, it was easy, but no, it does not work. There's no known, there's no obvious way of making the cusps of a, of, of a hyperbolic manifold joined at two, two, two hyperbolic manifolds joined at two cusps. There's no easy way to get the representation, uh, the linear representations to fit together by, everyone thinks that there is a deformation that makes them fit together, but, but nobody knows how to do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, 